Hello, and welcome to the Plant Breeding and Genomics Community of Practice webinar, Introduction to R Statistical Software, Application to Plant Breeding. My name is Heather Merck, and I'm the content coordinator for the Plant Breeding and Genomics Community of Practice, also called PBG, and one of your hosts today. John McQueen, our technical producer, will be our other host and will guide the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. After the 45-minute presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. If you have a question, you can simply type it in the question box on your screen and hit enter. If you can't see the question box, click the small plus sign next to the word on question on your control panel to open it up. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for in the 15-minute question period. After today's webinar, you will receive an email asking you to fill out a brief survey evaluation. Please complete this evaluation so that we may better tailor our webinars to your needs. In addition, please sign up to join us for future webinars. I'd like to thank you all for participating in the first of our series of how-to webinars. Today's presentation and supplemental files can be found at www.extension.org slash pages slash 60427. The webinar recording will also be posted here within the week. As I mentioned at the beginning, my name is Heather Merck and I am the content coordinator for the Plant Breeding and Genomics Community of Practice. I am also a member of the Tomato Breeding and Genetics Program at Ohio State University. I obtained my Honors Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto in Canada and my PhD in Genetics from the Pennsylvania State University. My PhD research focused on identification and mapping of disease resistance genes in tomato. So let's move on now to the presentation. So I'd like to begin with a brief introduction to our software, including the rationale for using R and how to obtain the free software. Afterwards, we'll open up R, demonstrate some basic commands using sample data. And this sample data is freely available online. And we'll conclude the web presentation by providing resources where you can learn more about using R and where you can obtain help. Before moving any further, I would like to present the learning objectives for the webinar. So this webinar is designed to provide you with skills and resources to install and run R, find R packages and install and load them, read in data and visualize distributions, test if there are differences between varieties, using ANOVA with linear regression, distinguish varieties using means and t-tests, estimate variance components, and use loops to simplify analysis. And I'd just like to provide a word of caution that learning R, like any other software or language, will require an investment of time. And my goal here today is to provide you with an introduction and some basic tools to help you get started. So first, a little bit about R. So R is an open source programming language for statistical analysis and graphing. It was developed based on S at the Bell Labs, who also developed Unix. So you'll see some similarities between commands in Unix and commands in R, which will provide some benefit, clearly, if you have experience with Unix. One of the big powers of R is that it provides us with a language, a tool, and an environment all in one package. And this is one of its great strengths and gives it a lot of f power and flexibility. And within R, functions and analyses are stored as objects, which allows us to modify the functions and build models. As well, there are many packages for specific applications that are already available and that are continuously being developed. So one of the largest and perhaps most well-developed examples is the Bioconductor Project for analysis and comprehension of high-throughput genomic data. 
And today, we'll get a little bit of experience using a package called LME4 that's useful when dealing with mixed effects models and also models with random effects. So, given that you're already attending this webinar, I don't know that I really need to provide a solid um, convincing statement of why you would want to use R, but to perhaps sway you a little bit more about why R may be good for you to use in your breeding program. So unlike a lot of other statistical software, R is freely available and doesn't require you to purchase a license or renew a license. As I mentioned, it's very powerful, and it's powerful not only for analyses, but also for creating publication quality figures. And many resources are constantly being developed and updated, and this is a real benefit when we think about um, genomic level analyses where the field is growing very quickly and this allows developers to more easily keep up to date with techniques that are being applied. And there's also built-in help with R and uh, forums available online where you can obtain help with R. So one of the first and most obvious questions may be, how can I get R? So if you go to www.rproject.org, it'll take you to the R homepage, and if you scroll down um, into the download R section or the getting started section, you can go right there and download R software. So when, when doing this, you'll be asked to choose what's called a CRAN mirror. And CRAN just stands for Comprehensive R Archive Network. And you'd like to select the mirror site that's closest to your location. And as you can see here, this is a list of mirrors and countries. And based on the fact that the first two countries listed are Argentina and Australia, you can tell that R is very much a global project with people all over the world working on it and also that many countries have more than one mirror site from which you can download R. And to see more of these countries and select the country and location closest to you, you just need to scroll down the page. Okay, so now that you've got R, you're ready to go. So let's launch R and get started. So the first thing that you will notice when you open up R is that you're presented with a menu, a few icons, but the main thing on your screen is going to be this R console. And this is going to be the workspace where you want to type in your commands. And for a lot of people, adjusting to the command line interface is a very big shift in thinking and a shift in a way of working. And I know that this was something for me that was a bit of a hurdle when I first started learning R, was getting used to typing a command on the command line and receiving a response from R within that command line. And really, the best way to become most comfortable with using the command line and with using R is to practice. And so, You'll see here, anytime you, you'll get this sort of caret at the beginning of your command line. And the commands that you type in will be shown in red by default. And when you receive a response from R, it will show up in blue. And so on this page, I've just got a few examples of some simple operations that you could perform in R. And so I'd like to provide a few comments about, or a few, yeah, a few comments about what we've got on the screen here. So the pound sign or the number sign here is used to denote that a comment follows. And so when you have that, R knows that that's not actually a line of code that you would like it to read in. It will just skip by that. And so here, what we want to do is create a vector 
with five components. And so we have um, our, I created an arrow here, and we can use an arrow or an equal sign as an operator. And so we're telling R that X is going to be a vector, and the C is to concatenate, and it's followed by our five vector components. We can perform scalar addition with our vector. So we've now got our vector, and we're adding four to each of our components. We can find the sum of those elements using the sum command, or we might want to know the highest value by entering the max command. And so it's by gaining comfort with these basic commands that we can really start to learn R. So I'd like to provide you with a resource just to introduce you to some basic commands in R. And they actually come in quite handy when even performing analyses with larger data sets because you will end up performing vector manipulations or accessing subsets of your data. And a lot of this is based on vectors and vector algebra. And so I would strongly encourage you to regularly practice using our software to gain proficiency and confidence. And after you've had some practice typing commands into R using the command line interface, and you start writing some more complex scripts, you'll probably want to obtain a text editor. And this allows you to really easily save and recall and subsequently modify scripts that you run in R. And so um, R for Mac has a built-in color text editor, and that's what I find to be just fine for me with working in R. Uh, for people who use Windows, there is an editor called Tin R, which stands for Tin is not Notepad. Um, and when putting together this webinar, I learned that there are often difficulties with Windows 7 and 10R, and also with newer versions of R and 10R. So I would caution you, uh, if you're a Windows user, in using this 10R web editor. But it can have some basic value for you, certainly. So you can still write and store a script using 10R. 10R very easily. So you may be wondering, well, I have this script file that I made in my text editor, but how can I actually run that using R? And so there are really two basic options. You can copy and paste from your text editor into the R console, or within 10R, you can click on this little R icon in your menu bar under Start and Close Connections you'd want to start the R GUI, and then click on a line of your script, and it will be highlighted in yellow, and then press Control and Enter. And one of the things that you'll see here in 10R is that your script is color-coded. So you can see that all of your comments are listed in green, and all of the sort of commands that you're telling R to perform are listed in black. So similarly, if you're using a text editor on a Mac, you could copy and paste your script into the R console, or you could highlight the lines that you'd like R to run and press Command and Enter. So this is just a slight difference between using R on a PC and using R on a Mac. And we can see here as well that the Mac editor for R is color-coded as well. And it does nice little things like when I have a true or false option, as you see after this header, R uh, denotes this with different colors. So I've got T and that's in orange.
So now I'd like to take just a little bit of time and talk about the sample data that we'll be working with. And as a reminder, this data is available to you online for your use and practice with R. So this data was collected um, for the SOLCAP project, or the SOLNACA Coordinated Agricultural Project, which is a USDA-funded grant program. And uh, processing tomato fruit shape, color, and quality data was collected and for the overall project, um, it was collected on a wider scope. But the data we're going to look at today, we have data from 2009 in one location with two reps. And we're looking at the color data. And we also have data from 2010 from one location, and there's one rep of this data. And it's also color data. And to obtain the data, the images were scanned and analyzed using tomato analyzer software. And the images on the right show you a little bit of the diversity that we had in the germplasm we were looking at. So you can see uh, processing tomatoes with different shape, size, and color. So next, what kind of data does R need um, in order to, to make use of it and in order for you to analyze your data. What format does it need to be in? So R works well with either tab delimited or CSV files. So if you start with an Excel file, like is posted online, you'll need to convert that into either a .txt txt or .csv format. And it's preferable to have your data in a flat format. As you can see here, we have our columns named line, rep, year, location, followed by our color parameters. By default, R likes missing data to be denoted as NA, and our headers should not have any spaces in the text no commas, which applies mainly for CSV files, and they should begin with a letter as opposed to a number or other symbol. And just as an aside, our data from the SOLCAP project includes 143 tomato lines, and for each line in each rep, we have data for multiple fruit. So now that we have our data file, we'd like to import this into R. And so, uh, just as an aside, all of the commands that we'll be discussing now, these are all available in a script file and that's available to you posted online. And the name is script 2009ohcolorsample.txt. So we can either read our data into R as a CSV or text file. And the way that we do that, the general command would be read.csv, and in brackets, the name of our file, including the file extension, in quotation marks, followed by a comma, and header equals T. So header equals true. So our data has a header. And if you're working with a PC, you'll want to note the direction of the slashes here. And so what I have in this graphic is just the ways of reading in a data set for either a PC or a Mac as a CSV or as a text file. And what I've done is I've given that data set a name within R. And the data set will be referred to as a data frame within R. So our data frame is called OH color. And if you're interested in learning more about importing data into R, as this can be one of the most challenging steps of working with R, I would refer you to um, a file created by the R data or R development team. And that's available online.
So we've imported our data into R. The next thing we want to do is check to make sure that everything actually worked properly and our data was imported correctly. And as a caution, the methods presented on this screen are really only when you're dealing with small data sets because these have a long printout for each line of your data set. And so you could use either just type in the name of our object, which is OH color, or we could type in print and OH color or summary and OH color. And those will all give us similar results. And I did not do that for this data set because it's rather large. So what I chose to do instead was to use what are called the head and tail commands. And so these allow us to see the first rows of our data and the header for the header head command or the last rows of our data including the header for the tail command. And you can see here an example of how I read in my data and how I looked at the first rows of our SOLCAP data here. So we've got essentially what it looked like in Excel. We've got our line, we've got our rep, year, location, followed by our color parameters. Another command for checking your data that I'm partial to is the structure command. And structure allows you to see the structure of your data set, including the total number of observations, which here is 2,539, the number of variables that you have, and how the variables are classified. And so R classifies our variables as either factors, like line and location are shown here, integers, as rep and location are shown here, or as numeric, as numeric. So that goes for all of our color parameters. And this becomes important because we're actually going to want R to treat things like rep and year as factors. And it is, by default, brought them in as integers because they're numbers. So we're going to have to tell R that we wanted to read them as factors. And we'll get to that a little bit later in the presentation. And so to use the structure command, you would type in str, followed by your object, which in this case is our data frame, called OH color. So we now know that R has read in our data correctly. The next thing we would probably want to do is visualize our data. And as I mentioned, one of the most powerful things that you can do with R is to create graphics. And they can be anywhere from something very simple, as we've shown here, to much more complex. And, you know, in this case, we're making just a basic histogram with our data. And so I've typed in HIST for histogram, the name of our object, and in this case, I want to look at one of my color parameters called parameter one. So I've typed in the name of my overall data set, included a dollar sign, which is to note that we're dealing with a subset of our data, followed by the name of that subset. And so when we create a graphic in R, you will see that it actually comes up in a separate window. And so now, we can see an example of building on that basic histogram. And so we've added color, we've labeled our axes, and we've given it a title, and we've also included an expected distribution in the form of a density plot. And so the code is included here for you to give you an idea of what you may be able to do with R. And to learn more about creating graphics in R, I would direct you to the R Graphics book um, by Mural in 2006. So moving on now to creating and analyzing simple ANOVA models using R. So 
one of the questions you may want to ask is whether there's a difference in your color parameters between lines. So in this case, I chose average green, and we want to look for differences between lines. And so we're doing this with the 2009 sample data, and it's data collected in one year and one location. And so we're going to create a linear model using LM and then in parentheses formula equals our model. So in this case our model is very straightforward. Ohio color followed by our continuous variable, average green. And now we're saying that that's proportional to, or we're testing that that's proportional to the line factor. And we want line not to be treated as an integer, but as a factor. So we need to specify that in our model. And we gave our model a name being fit1, so we named that object. And now we're looking at the analysis of variance table. And we can see, in fact, that there is the effect of line is, in fact, significant. significant. And you can see besides significance codes where um, the number of stars indicates the level of significance. So in this case, our result is highly significant. So you may have thought, you know, our code on the last screen was actually a little bit cumbersome. And then if you wanted to look at a more complex model, it really would be tedious and it would be easy to make a mistake if you were to have to type out, for example, your data set, the name of your data set every time you wanted to look at a subset or a factor of that. So we can take steps to simplify our code. One thing that we can do is we can rename our variables. So we're now going to create an object called line, and we're going to tell R that it's a factor and that it is the subset line of our overall color data set. So that the next time we want to refer to that variable, all we have to do is type in line. And it is important to note here that R is case sensitive. So you'll notice that I've named our new object using capital letters. And that's just a way for me to remember that that's an object that I've created. And when we look at average green, R had already treated average green as a numeric variable. So we didn't need to tell R that again. We could, but it's not necessary. So average green is now defined as a subset of our oh, OH color data set average green. And so now when we type in our model, which we've called fit1a, all we need to do is type in lm average green is proportional to line. And you'll see that we get the exact same analysis of variance output. So one thing that you may be asking yourself is, what about assumptions? We know that ANOVA has assumptions that should be met. And so one of the ways that we can graphically evaluate whether our data meets these assumptions is by using the plot command. And so all we've done here is entered the command plot followed by the name of our model, fit1 or fit1a, and we get four graphs as an output we get residuals versus fits, a QQ plot, a scale location plot, and the residuals versus leverage. And for the most part, the residuals versus fits and the QQ plot would be the most commonly encountered plots. And so just a note of caution, as with all large data sets, it's, it can be challenging to meet these expectations uh, when we have a large data set. And we know that within ANOVA, there's, the analysis is quite robust, so that deviations from the expected can be tolerated. So the, the model we ran is really a regression type 
model. So one thing that we may want to do is look at that regression output. And something to note here is that um, under our coefficients, the significance levels are, or the comparisons are to our intercept, which in this case is our first line, SCT0001. And so we see that a lot, or multiple lines here, appear to have significant, or appear to be significant compared with SCT0001. So we would probably want to follow up with t-tests and box plots. And multiple comparisons, though today we're not going to um, look at multiple comparisons. So before we're at the point of even running a t-test, we may want to summarize our data. So we may want to look at the mean and standard deviation of our various parameters or objects. And so here I've calculated the mean for average green and also the standard deviation for average green. And one thing to note here, if you have missing data, even though you've coded it as NA, you still need to tell R not to use that data when performing the analysis because it will come back telling you that it could not calculate the mean. So in your code, you need to include na.rm equals t or equals true. We can also get a little bit fancier if we want to, say, look at the mean average green by rep. And so we do that using a, something called t-apply. And this is a command that tells R to apply a function. In this case, our function is mean. So the line of code to calculate the mean by rep for our numeric variable is t-apply, the name of our variable, average green. We want to include our na.rm equals true. We're telling R to look at rep as a factor, and we're telling it that we want to calculate the mean. So R returns to us two mean values. We could also use a similar line of code, except replacing summary instead of mean, and that will give us our min, max, our mean, median, first and third quartiles by rep. So, Based on our ANOVA analysis, we knew that many lines were different from our SCT, our first line. And so we may want to test, does a particular line have an average green value that's higher than the overall mean? Or does one line have an average green level higher than another? We would test this using a t-test. And in R, um, our, our t-test is denoted t.test followed by x and y, which are numeric vectors. And R will always compare your x vector to your y vector. And that becomes important if you're looking at the case where we are, where we want to test whether um, a particular line is greater than the overall mean. And so to create our numeric vectors, so we, we've already named average green, and it's already a numeric vector. But now we have to create a vector with only the average green values for our line of interest. And in here, I selected SCT0006 as our line of interest. And so we're creating a vector from our OH color data set, and within that, we want to look for our row, that's the first value within our, our, um, within our data frame, it's the row, and we want to look at line, but only when line is equal to SCT0006. And so that's what the two equal signs denote, 
and then we want and then there's a comma telling R now to look at the column and we only want to select the column average green. And then we can check our numeric vector by just entering the name of the vector and R will give us back the values. And now we're ready to perform our t-test. So our vectors are X and Y or SCT006 and average green. Our alternative is that we want to know if SCT is greater than the overall mean and we're saying that the variances are equal. And as a note, you may want to adjust the confidence level. So the default is 0 0.95, but you can adjust that by including in your command conf dot level equals, and then you would insert your desired level. And so in this case, we can see we have a very small p-value and then it, that in fact the average green level of SCT0006 is greater than the overall mean. So we may also want to look at a box plot and so here we've just typed in the command box plot followed by the model that we would like to test and R will give us this output. So You'll remember that our SOLCAP data set had data for two years and that the data for those two years was in separate files. So we need to combine those two data sets and we can do this very easily using R. And so the name of our 2010 data set is 2010 OH color sample.xls. We would import that into R the same way that we did for our 2009 data. And now we're ready to combine our data frames or data sets. In order to do this, our data frames need to have exactly the same headers so that R can recognize that they're the same in both data sets. Then we use what's called the row bind or R bind command and combine our two data frames. And we can use a similar type command if we'd like to combine two data sets by column using the cbind command. So now that we have our two-year data, we want to check that data just to make sure everything is correct using the structure command. And we now have data that was collected in one location over two years and we have a total of three reps. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to rename our variables so that they're factors and not treated as integers for ease of our use. And one thing of note is that R will recognize the most recent object name. So if you use the same name multiple times, R will use only your most recent or your latest iteration of that. So we had average green before just for our 2009 data and now we're using the name average green for our combined data set. So we may now want to look at a multi-year ANOVA and in this case, we want to consider rep and year as fixed. And to denote nesting, as in the case of rep and year, we used the, uh, the command or the, the syntax percent in percent. To denote interactions, you can use either a colon or an asterisk. And you'll see here a similar ANOVA output as we had for the single year as well as our significance code. And we see here that we have significant effects of line, year, rep within a year, and line by year interactions. So for many plant bleeding applications, we would want to consider our main effects random 
and we would want to estimate the proportion of variance due to effects in our experimental design. For example, if we want to estimate heritability. So to look at these random effects, we need to use the LME4 package. So the first thing you, that you'll need to do is to install the LME4 package. The simplest way to do this is using the R menu, click on Packages, Install Package, and then select the package that you would like. And just as a note, there are over 2,000 packages currently available for R. So you only need to install a package once, but you need to load it in every R session you want to use it in. And the reason for this is there are so many packages available that if you were to try to download them all and have them all running every time you were using R, you would crash your system. And so this is why you're required each time you want to use a package you need to load it. And you load a package using the library command. So in this case, we type library LME4. So we use the LMER command within this package to look at our model with random effects. We denote an, an effect as random by entering 1, the bar, and then the name of our object. And this LME LMER command can also be used with mixed models. So in this case, we've denoted all of our effects as random. And so by using the summary command of our model, we can derive the variance components, which can be used to estimate heritability. To learn more about the LME4 package, I would direct you to the online documentation for this package. And this is freely available online. So now, er, in order to do our variance components analysis, we had to combine two data sets. And it may be useful to now export that new data set that combines both of our years. We can do that easily using R by using the write.table command. And we would follow that with the name of our data frame, in this case, combined color. We would type in col.names equals na. And this is very important. Otherwise, your data will not be read into Excel with your headers nicely appearing. And then you type in the name of the file that you would like this combined data set to be named as. And you'll want to use a .txt extension. And then you may open this file using Excel. So as the final part of the presentation today, I would like to provide a brief introduction to loops. And this introduction is based on some online materials that are freely available, and I would refer you to those for more examples. So you might want to write a loop to both save time and simplify your code as you get to writing longer scripts that have a repetitive nature. Today I'm just going to provide you with an example of a for loop and a while loop. So a for loop takes the form of having four followed by a variable in a sequence and an expression, or a series of expressions. So in the example provided here, we have 4x, when x is equal to 1 through 10, we want to print the square root of x. And so we can get this printout, and there are multiple ways of writing this syntax. And the while loop takes the form of while, followed by a condition, 
and then an expression or a series of expressions. And the example here is a Fibonacci series. And so you can see we have a series of commands and our condition, well, B is less than 50, followed by a series of expressions so that we obtain a Fibonacci series as our output. So you may be wondering how you can really apply that to your work. And I provide here a brief example of a single marker trait analysis. And you'll note that actually this code and data is not at this point provided to you online. And here we want to test the association between a trait and a marker, looking at one marker at a time. So we're going to just use the simple linear model where our trait is proportional to our marker, and then we can write a for loop. So we have for, and then we have a sequence. So for, for x, from the third column, to the end of the column of our data, or to the end of the columns in our data sets. And the three is because our marker data begins in our third column. And then we have our series of expressions. So finally, I'd like to just provide you with a couple of commands that you can use to obtain help. And this would really be to obtain help writing particular commands within R. So these help functions show you what is required um, when you're entering a command. And you can also submit a question to the R help mailing list. So you can sign up for the list, submit questions, um, and it seems based on my experience that these questions are answered by statisticians, people with knowledge of R, I would caution you to make sure that you um, that your question has not been previously answered. So you can search through all the questions that have been asked and answered. And this is actually, I believe, a very valuable resource. And so where can you learn more about R? So as part of the plant breeding and genomics community of practice, we're actively developing content that's designed for plant breeders to help learn R and make use of R statistical software. And that's coming as we speak. This is sort of the rollout of our R content. And so I encourage you to revisit or to visit uh, eextension.org slash plant underscore breeding underscore genomics throughout the fall to look for updates. And where else can you learn more about R? So I mentioned already this uh, R Basics tutorial for learning the basic commands in R. Also, there are resources specifically designed for biologists, introductory statistics. Uh, this past summer, I attended the Summer Institute for Statistical Genetics at the University of Washington. So I would direct you there. Or there's also an annual Use R conference, and that switches back and forth between being in Europe and being in North America each year. You can look at some general texts. Um, and these are just the resources that I mentioned throughout the presentation. Importing data, graphics, the LME4 package, programming in R. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge other members of um, the Plant Breeding and Genetics Group at Ohio State University, Dr. David Francis, the PI, Dr. Song Chur Sim, and Dr. Deborah Lee, or not, I'm sorry, Deborah Lee Abuff, who was a visiting scholar from France. I also like to acknowledge Dr. Walter de Young from Cornell University, John McQueen for technical support, and our evaluator, Michael Coe. Supplementary files are available online, and you will be receiving a survey evaluation via email. Please fill out that survey to help us um, provide content that you desire and that you would like to see. So now I'd like to th turn things over to John McQueen so that we can have a brief question and answer session. Thanks, Heather, and thanks for that great introduction to R. 
Um, you did a really great job, and I want to encourage you to, if you have questions, we have about 10 minutes to answer questions. So go back to that question box on your screen. Uh, if you can't see it, there's a little plus sign next to it. You can open that up, type your question in, and submit it that way, and it'll come in, and then I can read those out uh, to Heather. So I'll take a few minutes here. Go ahead and start typing questions in. Um, if you're just happy to join us, we did have a little mix-up on time. Uh, we did start at 1 p.m. Eastern, but we did record. We are recording the entire session, and we'll have it posted in a couple of days to the eExtension website. Um, so please check for that. So we got a few questions coming in. First, we have a, a thank you. So that was uh, that's very nice. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question: Is 2.2 to uh, a negative 13? the minimum p-value possible in R? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure of the answer of that, actually. I know that R can give you very small p-values. Um, I don't know what the limit is. OK, thanks. Um, we have another question here. Uh, they would like to have the commands for SNP and trade association. Interested in obtaining some commands for that. Okay. Um, you know, at this point in time, we have worked with just single marker and trade analysis. Um, in future, we would like to provide documentation or provide commands for more complex analysis. I assume you're looking more of a, say, genome-wide association analysis, is that correct? Yes. Okay. You know, that's certainly something we can look into for a future webinar. So thank you very much for that suggestion. Great. Uh, and Sunchur said that some of the SNP trade analysis is available through TASL, I guess currently. Great. Um, Thank and, you very much, Sumter. And going back to the question about the minimum p-value, they just said that they, they, they see that number all the time. So it must just be uh, some general knowledge floating around. Uh, so another question here. With, with a PC, can Notepad be used instead of the 10R as the text editor? Yes, it can be used. Uh, one of the reasons it's not recommended is that the, um, the spacing is is not correct if you are, say, um, copying and pasting a script from somewhere. Um, I do have a little bit of experience using Notepad++, and I found that to be a better solution than just Notepad. Yeah, and I've used Notepad++ myself in my own work, and it's, it's a free download, and it's, it's, it's good. Um, so is there another question coming in? Uh, is any R code for genome selection? My guess would be that it's probably out there. <laughs> um, that, yeah, I see Sungture says here to check Tassel, and I, I would recommend that as well. Uh, do you see the questions out, Heather? Do you see the you message's comment there about the p-value? Not I can't can, see it very You can well. pop that oh. little box out and oh. make it bigger. I see that. Thank you very much, Umesh. So it, it's can, R can provide a p value up to uh, 10 to the 238th. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have another question. Can you provide more explanation to first time users? So I'm not um, if you could, if you could type back in a comment with uh, Michael with a little bit more, which explanation you're looking for. And I would also encourage you. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to do is um, with the online content that we'll be providing on eExtension later this fall, is really to cover a very wide range and to really lay out a lot of those basics and at a pace where if you've never opened up R and you really want to follow along that we will be making that available to you as well but if you have a specific question I'm happy to address that now as well 
And people can go to eExtension at uh, www.extension.org slash ask. And there's a, there's a way to input a question that way. Just make sure to tag your question as plant breeding and genomics, and uh, that'll get to uh, Heather and her group. And as an alternative, you can at, an, at any time, you're welcome to also contact me directly. And my email address, if I can get back to one of the whoops, first slides here, I can put that back up for you. And Heather, do you think it'll be possible to post some of those resources on the webinar page? Because I know I went through some kind of quickly a little bit with all those resources. Yes. And in addition, what I'll do is actually the, there's a PDF of this presentation currently available. But I will also um, enter in all of the resources and provide direct links as well for everyone. Oh, great. And that all of the, um, in terms of the websites, um, all of those are freely av available for anyone to access as well. Perfect. Um, if there's any more questions, uh, sneak them in here at the last couple minutes. Uh, I don't see any more coming in. I think you answered them all, Heather. Um, so we're getting some virtual applause here from some <laughs> folks typing things. Uh, one other quick question. Uh, will you have classes in the future exclusively on data analysis for breeders? It's, I think it's certainly a, a possibility um, that we are really trying to target a, a breeding audience. And so we're looking at this point really to build up um, our relevant data analysis um, content on e-extension and if you look at the future webinars, we, we have one specifically planned later this fall for analysis using an augmented design and would appreciate suggestions or input for um, future webinars or content beyond the fall. So it looks like we're just about all, about all of time, out of time, but I would really like to thank all of you for participating in our inaugural, our, our inaugural webinar of the series and very much appreciate the support um, by your online applause and questions and thank you very much for helping make this a successful project.